we do have uh, uh, a nice crowd that is signed up for this meeting and I uh, hope that they will, they usually frankly join a couple minutes after the start time. And so I don't want to race into Dr. June Rhee until we have critical mass on the line. On the other hand, uh, there will be a, a recording of this. And Brian, have we heard from Dr. Stock whether she will be able to join us on time? We have not heard from Dr. Stock yet. Okay, so she's probably still in clinic, Nirali. If you'd like to lift off the meeting, that would be lovely. You want to give it a couple minutes or? It's not even four yet, so we'll give it a couple minutes. <laughs> Welcome, everyone. We're just going to give it a couple minutes. How are you guys doing in this heat wave? <laughs> I've learned something that might be helpful to you, which is I keep ice packs in the freezer and I keep them around me often uh, to stay comfortable. It's very difficult to um, manage the heat, I think. Yes. I actually learned that from my ankle break a few years ago that, gee, if I have ice packed around my ankle, of course, my whole body is cooler. So just a little small um, help in these very hot days, especially for someone in a very warm condition like yeah. you are in a rally. I'm in a warm condition, that's a good way to put it. <laughs> well, maybe just while people are joining, I can list off some of our wonderful key partners. Um, yes. We uh, have up on our website the amazing uh, collaborative partners that we have, uh, but the U.S. Million Hearts uh, program of the Centers for Disease Control and CMS is a major inspiration and collaborator of ours. We are going to have Dr. Larry Sperling, the director of the Million Hearts Program, as our speaker on August 10th. And uh, we also have, uh, you know, wonderful uh, help in starting this project from various state agencies, including the California Department of Public Health, many local public health agencies, uh, several of the health plans of California, including Blue Shield, HealthNet, Kaiser. Uh, we have um, medical groups from around the state signed up to be with us. Uh, and here I see uh, Dr. Flynn, one of the co-founders of our University Best Practices has just joined us by video. Thank you for helping us start our very first community in 2011 in San Diego. Uh, and so now we have four regional groups around the state. And not only do we have people participating from around the state and across the universities of uh, California, but we have other states joining us as well. So I want to take the time to thank our uh, key supporters, the California Department of Public Health, Blue Shield of California, uh, Ameren, Amgen, Beringer Ingelheim, Genentech, Johnson & Johnson, Novartis, Novo Nordisk, and the Santa Clara Health Trust is our most recent supporter. So we do have leadership with us from around the state, uh, including Dr. Scott Flynn, who's joining us from Poway, California, I believe, uh, and uh, as well as uh, Hopefully Dr. Stock will be joining us from UCSF shortly. And I just wanna say that I was so thrilled to review the slides this morning and see um, that we are making progress together as a community. It was lovely to see that uh, Stanford, which has been one of the major research entities engaged in this huge battle against the pandemic, does have a lower death rate than uh, the general death rate in the United States. And we'll be hearing from Dr. Jun Rhee about that uh, in great detail in just a few minutes. So with that, I'm going to turn the 
the mic over to our chairwoman, Dr. Nirali Vora, neurologist at Stanford University. Thank you for being with us, everyone. Yes, thank you all for joining. Um, some of you may be in the dense heat as, as I am right now. So apologies if my fan is going in the background, but thank you again for joining us. I'm really excited about the program today. Um, obviously, you know, COVID remains on our minds and in the context of cardiovascular um, disease and stroke. And so we want to be able to share some updates in the science um, to, to talk about cardiovascular complications from COVID-19, which many of you may be reading more about in the press and things we've alluded to before. We're gonna get a very phenomenal and structured and very up-to-date presentation from Dr. Rhee. Um, and then we'll also talk about uh, leveraging telehealth opportunities to really ensure that we are delivering the best care for our patients, right? time, right place, all that. Um, and so we have our uh, pharmacy, um, uh, pharmacy professor and innovator, Dr. Stebbins joining us, as well as starting to hear about that shift back into um, patient care as we see some of the restrictions listed and lifted and realize that we can't keep waiting to take care of our patients, but the time is really now. And so we'll hear about re-engaging our patients um, using telehealth and other tools from Ed Yu, uh, Dr. Ed Yu, our CQO at Palo Alto Medical Foundation, as well as updates from Dr. Flynn, as you've heard, um, medical director at Blue Shield California, myself and Dr. Stock, uh, she should be able to join for, about, from UCSF shortly at the end of this, towards the end of the meeting. So again, we have a packed program as is Patty's specialty, <laughs> but we'll, we'll keep it moving. We'll try to take questions a few here and there, otherwise we can consolidate them at the end. Please use the Q&A function so that we can really consolidate all the questions and that even if we have to keep moving to stay on time, the speakers can actually answer them through the Q&A and re let's reserve the chat function for technical issues. So um, with that, uh, I will um, bring on, uh, oh, there's Dr. Uh, there's Hattie's bio, but let's let's actually, should we just move forward to Dr. Rhee's bio? Absolutely, sorry, I just raced through my section to try to give more time to Dr. Yeah. Rhee. It's such an exciting there we go. presentation. So we just discovered, rediscovered, I, I thought she looked familiar that um, <laughs> Dr. Rhee was, was one of my, you know, rotator residents. So I'm so, so happy to see how much she's um, progressed and really taking a lead as a cardiologist now and an instructor at Stanford. Um, and although her focus is in cardio-oncology, which could be a whole talk in and of itself, she has recently delivered a very popular Grand Rounds at Stanford and is gonna share with us, again, an updated version of that talk, really getting at, um, getting at the cardiovascular complications in COVID. But you can see from her bio, which I'll, I won't read off here, that she is an experienced scientist and has a lot to offer our community. So, Dr. Ree, why don't you take it away? Thank you. Um, thank you so much for inviting me to give a talk today. Um, so originally, as Dr. Vora said, um, in our cardio-oncology program or a cardio-oncology team at Stanford uh, gave a grand round on a very, a very same topic about two months ago. Initially, we thought that we needed to learn more about COVID-19 before the outbreak in the US. Um, thinking that our cancer patients would be at a heightened risk for COVID-19 as well as complications. But as we learn more about COVID-19 and review the data, we realize that actually our cardiac patients are not only at an increased risk for infection, but they're worse off um, with um, a significant increased um, mortality. Um, so, you know, we got together and reviewed the data and delivered a grand rounds, and since then, there have been some exponential amount of information, research articles um, that came out um, regarding COVID-19. Next slide. And as you can see, when I did a PubMed, um, uh, next slide, please. Uh, when I did a PubMed on COVID-19, ever since January 1st, 2020, there have been more than 15,000 articles. And as you can see, like so much data has been rushed in, and it's really hard to keep up with it. So really my uh, focus today is really not to overload you with so much data, but really to 
uh, summarize available data and highlight some key points and considerations regarding uh, cardiac care of the patients with COVID-19. So in our talk, in my talk, I will first briefly go over the biology as well as epidemiology related COVID-19. Then I'll really dive into uh, um, uh, data related uh, cardiac complications um, with COVID-19 and some of the available um, uh, existing experimental treatment options. And finally, I will finish my talk with some ACE inhibitor and ARB considerations as there have been some concerns with this drug therapy given the overlapping biology with COVID-19. Next slide. So just brief uh, biology about SARS-CoV-2, which is the actual virus causing, uh, causing the disease of COVID-19. It is a single stranded RNA virus uh, that's very similar to the, the original SARS um, um, that's been uh, um, in 2003. And when you look at uh, the virus on the surface, there's a spike proteins. And inside the virus, there's an RNA. And the important, importance about this spike protein is that it actually binds the um, angiotensin converting enzyme 2 that's been expressed on a cell surface, which then the virus gets internalized and actually release into the cell, leading into cell infection. And again, ACE2 has a lot of overlapping biology with the angiotensin receptor, uh, ACE inhibitor, as well as ARB. So we'll talk a little more about the existing data related to drug, uh, drug therapy, but this is how the biology works. Next slide. And we know that the COVID-19 is still ongoing. So I just accessed um, the Johns Hopkins University uh, database on COVID-19, and there so far has been uh, more than 5.4 million confirmed COVID-19 cases in the world. In the world, and as you can see, the slope hat is still going up. And in the U.S., next slide, um, there has been about 1.6 or greater than 1.6 million cases um, confirmed COVID-19, making the U.S. the number one uh, country in the world with the most number of cases. And there have been greater than 97,000 deaths, making the overall case fatality rates about 5.9%. Next slide. At Stanford, we were actually pretty fortunate that we didn't see a whole lot of cases. So far, we saw 95 patient cases confirmed COVID-19 and 20 of them ended up being cared in an ICU. There have been four deaths, but only two of them were already on a DNR DNI so that people didn't escalate the care. And uh, we had two major cardiac complications, including one uh, pretty major electrical storm and one uh, pulmonary embolism and no stroke so far. Next slide. Um, so in terms of case fatality rate, um, when you look at just the overall worldwide data, um, the, there have been recorded at 6.3%, but the rates vary pretty widely. So um, when, when you look at the graph on the left side, majority of the European countries are actually reporting uh, case fatality rates greater than 10%. Next slide. And again, um, US has 5.9%, but interestingly, a, a country like Singapore only reports 0.1% of the case fatality rate. So why do you so much difference in terms of the rates? Uh, one theory behind is, yes, certainly there could be some ethnic or racial differences in response to COVID-19. And second, there could also be some underdiagnosis of COVID-19 because a majority of patients infected with COVID-19 apparently are only mildly symptomatic. Um, but still, you know, we don't really quite understand what the true case fatality rate is. Next slide. But what we do know is that um, it is certainly more fatal than flu. Next slide. And uh, it's much more fatal among the patients who are uh, who, with advanced age. So when people looked into the data from Italy, that's published in JAMA this year, uh, the case fatality rate was about 20% among the octogenarians. So we really got to protect the elderly patients and you know, do the best care possible. Next slide. And when, when people then uh, looked into the cause of the mortality, obviously, uh, you know, majority of the cases were secondary to respiratory failure and pulmonary complications. But what was really striking to many was that up to one third of the cause of the death was secondary to concurrent pulmonary and cardiac injury. And 7% in, uh, in, uh, of the, uh, 
for the, the cause of death was actually primary cardiac and etiology. So people started really appreciating this in a pretty significant role of cardiac complications leading into morbidity and mortality associated with COVID-19. Next slide. And you know, when Chinese researchers looked into the first 100 patients diagnosed with COVID-19, despite their age, on average age was less than 60 years old, there were 40% of patients who actually had a pre-existing cardiovascular or cerebrovascular disease. Um, suggesting that there's a high burden of underlying cardiovascular disease among patients with infection, COVID-19 infection. And when people also looked into case fatality rates associated with these comorbidities, they found that the cardiovascular disease is really the number one risk factor uh, leading to worse mortality as well as worse outcome. Next slide. And more accumulating, accumul accumulating data also suggests the same. So when uh, researchers looked into those people ended up being an ICU versus no ICU, um, much more patients had a hypertension, pre-existing cardiovascular disease and diabetes. Next slide. And similar pattern also existed uh, when people looked into survivors versus non-survivors in about 190 patients in China. And again, Corner heart disease was about 24 times more likely to be among the non-survivors versus survivors. But people could just say, hey, these data are all from the initial observations from China. And there could be some ethnic differences. So what about non-Asians? Next slide. So then researchers actually pulled all the data from 169 hospitals across 11 different countries. And now, as you can see in this uh, table, greater than 60% of patients were white. And now out of 8,910 uh, uh, patients, uh, 515 died. And when they compared the survivors and non-survivors, next slide, um, again, the underlying heart disease, such as coronary artery disease, heart failure, or cardiac arrhythmia were pretty uh, more predominant among the non-survivors versus survivors. Um, one interesting factor here is that unlike what Chinese uh, research um, has shown, uh, the data from this study actually didn't show any significant differences in terms of the rate of hypertension. But regardless, it appears that underlying cardiovascular disease seems to be a pretty important risk factor for worse outcome. Next slide. So then what happens and what happens to the heart when you get infected with COVID-19? So, so far the existing data suggests that there could, there are the two major things can happen with COVID-19. There could be some in a my, direct myocardial injury uh, with a subsequent cardiac dysfunction. And, and also people can have arrhythmia with subsequent potential fatal arrhythmia like cardiac arrest. And some subset of patients may suffer from pulmonary heart hypertension and right-sided heart failure in the setting of lung disease. So we'll look into the data a little bit more. Next slide. In terms of myocardial injury evidenced by elevated troponin in the serum, um, so a group of Chinese researchers actually measured troponin levels from all comers uh, with COVID-19 in Wuhan, China. Next slide. And when they compared the patients with cardiac injury versus without cardiac injury, those with cardiac injury was, were significantly um, more likely to die from, uh, compared to those without cardiac injury. Um, and their survival rate was as low as about 50% compared to 90% uh, in this population. And next slide. And when people actually looked into whether in any concurrent pre-existing cardiovascular disease um, portends a worse outcome, um, if somebody has a pre-existing cardiovascular disease and uh, elevated troponin, in, uh, troponin levels suggesting myocardial injury, then their mortality rate was as high as 70%. This is dramatically high, um, higher than just you know, reported case fatality rate related to COVID-19. So definitely if somebody has a pre-existing cardiovascular disease and evidence of cardiac injury, then that's a the number one risk factor uh, for the poor outcome, especially with related to cardiovascular system. Next slide. 
So I, I would like to just present a case uh, that actually has been heavily discussed among the cardiologists and was published recently in European Heart Journal. So the case describes a 37 year old gentleman who came to the hospital after three days of chest pain and shortness of breath and diarrhea. Um, as you can see in this chest X-ray and, and then and CAT, and, uh, CT scan, there's some classic pattern of uh, lung findings, including ground glass opacities to suggest um, underlying COVID-19 infection. And there's some remarkable pleural effusion. And EKG actually showed a pretty uh, obvious ST elevation um, to suggest potential pericarditis. Next slide. And um, he then um, was found sputum positive for SARS-CoV-2. And what's really remarkable in this case is that his cardiac biomarkers were just remarkably elevated. Troponin was over, um, just over the detection limit. CKMB was also uh, markedly elevated. So as the anti-pro BMP to suggest that the patient has not only a profound myocardial injury, but also heart failure. And as we expected, um, there's no significant coronary artery disease on a CT scan. And the ultrasound of the heart actually showed a markedly decreased cardiac function with ejection fraction of 27%. Next slide. Ultimately, they thought that he had a presumed virus associated myocarditis in the setting of COVID-19. And the patient was um, treated with supportive care and some immune modulators, including steroid and IVIG therapy with some subsequent improvement. Next slide. So this is actually a pretty um, extreme case with just uh, uh, troponin elevation through the roof. But majority of cases, the troponin elevation is very subtle. It's like just, just right above the 99th percentile detection level. And even so, people are suggesting uh, reporting a much higher risk of mortality and, and death associated with this. So you know, people are now thinking about what could be the underlying mechanisms. So it could certainly be a myocarditis with underlying inflammation. And you know, when there's a lot of immune reaction respond and respond to infection, there could also be a cytokine storm uh, with subsequent hemodynamic compromise causing the myocardial injury. And some of the recent data actually suggests that you know, COVID-19 patients are more likely to form a clot. So increased thrombogenicity along with some vascular dysfunction can also cause some microvascular injury leading to cardiac injury. And then a virus can itself um, you know, get into the heart muscle as well. The heart muscle does have an expression of ACE converting, uh, uh, ACE converting enzyme 2. So angiotensin converting enzyme 2 and, and virus can actually get into the cells and cause direct injury. And in many other um, you know, severe cases of uh, you know, uh, infection, and it can also cause hypoxia induced myocardial injury as well as demand ischemia. So we don't really know exactly what's the primary cause of myocardial injury seen in the COVID-19 while there are lots of theories behind it. But what we know is that irrespective of this underlying mechanism, uh, the presence of cardiac injury itself appears to portend significant, significantly worse outcome among these patients with COVID-19. So again, this is an important biomarker for us to really know who is at risk and who is not at risk. Next slide. Um, then what about arrhythmia? There have been the, um, you know, social media hype regarding this you know, sudden cardiac death and dangerous heart rhythm associated with COVID-19. Uh, next slide. And there's actually one major study reporting this arrhythmia from Chinese group. They looked into um, 138 patients and reported 16.7% rates of arrhythmia. And when they actually looked into those who ended up being in ICU, about 44% of patients had arrhythmia. But what's really not known is the type of arrhythmia. We don't know whether it's a benign atrial arrhythmia or fatal ventricular arrhythmia. Nothing has been described or reported. But regardless, it was significant enough that it made it to our American College of Cardiology guideline. Um, saying that you know, these patients may be at a high risk for arrhythmia. Next, next slide. Since then, there has been one more study reporting arrhythmia rates, 
from New York. Um, they looked into 393 consecutive patients with COVID-19 um, cared in two hospitals in New York. And there they, they reported a 17.7% of atrial arrhythmia uh, among the patients um, who were intubated versus only 2% among those who are not intubated. So again, it appears that, and then the rest of the studies actually didn't really report any incidence of arrhythmia. But overall, it appears that even though we don't know the exact rates or types, arrhythmia appears to be uh, quite common among the patients with COVID-19. Next slide. So in terms of summary of COVID-19 related cardiac complications, first, we know that patients with pre-existing cardiovascular disease have overall poor prognosis and worse outcome. And patients who suffer from myocardial injury as evidenced by elevated troponin levels also appear to have worse outcome. And um, some frequently seen cardiovascular complications include myocardial injury um, evidenced by troponin T elevation with subsequent cardiac dysfunction and uh, potentially increased rates of arrhythmia or the, or the type of the arrhythmia to be determined. Next slide. And again, irrespective of the mechanism, uh, if somebody has a biomarker positive for troponin elevation in association with COVID-19, we do need to pay an extra attention to these patients as this portends a significantly worse outcome. Next slide. So then what about treatments? Are there any treatments? Um, so you know, before we go over the treatment, we kind of need to review the phases of the infection. Um, so initially, as you can see, the viruses enter into the system, uh, your nasal mucosa or you know, gut mucosa, and replicates and causes direct local injury. So that's a stage one with an early infection. But as the infection progresses, um, they now like uh, activate some immune cells, both in, uh, innate as well as adapted, recruiting macrophages, B cells and T cells. And as these cells get more activated, they now start secreting more cytokines and there could be some uh, positive feedback into uh, the each immune cells, uh, making this inflammatory response to be more hyper and, uh, make, uh, and then the, the last stage of the infection is more predominant inflammatory response phase. So depending on which stage the patient is on in terms of the infection, you know, we should really tailor our therapy towards that. So in terms of the first stage one, next slide, as many of you now know that there is antivirus medication called remdesivir uh, made by Gilead. So remdesivir was originally designed to uh, inhibit Ebola virus. But as Ebola virus and COVID-19 share the same RNA dependent RNA polymerase, um, they actually confirm that it's actually effective against COVID-19 or SARS-CoV-2 in vitro and in animal studies and subsequently it went on for a clinical trial. So we now have a preliminary data from this trial that's been published about a week ago in New England Journal of Medicine. So they recruited 1,059 patients, half of them were assigned to remdesivir and the other half assigned to placebo. And they reported that those who are treated with uh, remdesivir were significantly more likely to recover early and their median recovery time was 11 days versus um, 15 days among the patients who were treated with placebo. Unfortunately, they didn't meet a statistical significance for mortality, but as you can see in this graph, as well as the percent mortality, it appears that there's a trend towards improved survival among those um, who are treated with remdesivir uh, versus placebo. So one important consideration is this. Um, you know, so they actually recruited all comers with COVID-19, but what they um, started noticing is that this antiviral medication appeared to be more effective in the earlier phase of infection, as well as those who were less sick at the beginning. So again, you know, it's like, a, you know, when we think about Tamiflu, it's only effective um, for flu treatment when you get, when you treat the patients at the first three, three days since the 
onset of symptoms. So it may actually be like that, similar to influenza treatment, where remdesivir is the most efficacious for the earlier phase of the infection. So certainly more data to come and more analysis to be done, but at least this is quite encouraging to the point that I believe it led to an FDA approval next day. Next slide. And some people actually thought about what about the antiretroviral medication or anti-HIV medication. Unfortunately, um, it didn't work. And the, the data suggests that there's no uh, benefit with the medication. Next slide. But um, there's a re there was a really hype, a real hype regarding the hydroxychloroquine, the anti-malaria medication. Even though it was a primarily um, treating for anti-malaria, apparently it has some antiviral properties. So there were some anecdotal reports of using hydroxychloroquine with improved outcomes. So people started using that. And hydroxy uh, hydroxychloroquine is the medication with some pretty significant cardiotoxicities. It not only prolongs a QD, QT interval on an EKG, EKG leading to potentially dangerous heart rhythm called torsad, it can also have a direct um, toxicity to the heart leading to cardiac dysfunction. And it can also um, uh, lead into the abnormal conduction uh, system in the heart. So again, like a lot of caution is necessary, but people have been using it. So since so many people were using it, uh, um, you know, there is a lot of data available for people to analyze. So this is, this is a study published about a couple of weeks ago in New England Journal of Medicine. They looked into about uh, 1,400 patients with COVID-19, about 800 were treated with hydroxychloroquine and 560 patients with, were not treated with hydrox hydroxychloroquine. And from their analysis, there was really no difference in terms of the rate of intubation or death when they adjusted for the clinical variables. So at least uh, this, um, this, this article says, hey, uh, you know, there's not much efficacy with hydroxychloroquine. Next slide. Then um, another study came out about four days ago, and this is a probably uh, the largest data registry existing with COVID-19. So they pulled any available data possible from all across the countries in the world, and they recruited a total of 96,000 patients with COVID-19. And among them, 14,888 patients were treated with hydroxychloroquine. And as you can see in this figure, uh, patients who are treated with chloroquine were significantly more um, at an increased risk for death. And this is actually even after they adjusted for all different kinds of clinical variables. So it's not even like unclear benefit, it's a worse outcome with increased risk of death. And certainly this was alarming. And then the next slide. When they looked into some other uh, important outcomes, especially related to ventricular arrhythmia, because hydro as hydroxychloroquine has a significant toxicities into the electrical system of the heart, they noted that there is also markedly increased and statistic statistically significant risk of uh, ventricular arrhythmia among the patients who are treated with any form of hydroxychloroquine. And this is pretty remarkable because until now we, we, we've been just talking about potential risk. But now with this large, large data uh, registry, we now see a clear risk associated with hydroxychloroquine and also clear um, no benefit associated with regarding COVID-19. So due to the safety concern, WHO uh, actually decided to um, temporarily paused their ongoing clinical trial called Solidarity to really examine their data to see whether they should really continue their trial or not. Um, so again, you know, hydro hydroxychloroquine, despite the initial excitement, it appears to be rather uh, dangerous or unsafe without a clear benefit. Next slide. So until now, we talked about this uh, virus-focused medications. But again, again, as I talked about, toward the, as the infection progresses, now like there are more increased inf inflammatory response and role of inflammation. Um, so recently, Lancet also um, 
at this uh, pretty uh, important review article on a hey, potential uh, cytokine storm uh, syndrome that's been seen in the COVID-19 and the role of immunosuppression. Next slide. And then when they looked into it, um, they found that patients with COVID-19 had a pr prominent lymphopenia, meaning low lymphocytes despite the uh, normal white blood cell count. And also um, this lymphopenia appears to be correlating with the disease severity and a risk for cytokine storm. Um, so they, you know, they hypothesized that cytokine storm really, uh, toward the end of this infection, the uh, infection of COVID-19 may play a, a pretty important role uh, in the disease progression and, and, the, and the worst mortality. Next slide. So IL-6 is one of the major cytokine related to the cytokine storm. And again, as uh, when people looked into patients with severe infection versus no severe infection, they saw a markedly elevated level of IL-6 cytokine, uh, which actually led to a um, trial where, you know, whether blockage of um, IL-6 could lead into improved um, outcome among the patients in, uh, in the inflammatory phase. Uh, one of the major medication targeting IL-6 is called tocilizumab. Next slide. And actually a group of researchers in China reported that tocilizumab treatment may have a promising result. So it wasn't a clinical trial, but they recruited 21 patients with severe um, COVID-19 infection. And they started treating the patients with this tocilizumab targeting IL-6 and found that 19 patients out of this 21 had a rapid improvement in their clinical condition. And also there are some marked decrease in their inflammatory markers. So again, this is not a clinical trial and we don't know for sure whether it's efficacious compared to the placebo. And there's a couple uh, clinical trials are going on, but just when you think about the potential disease spectrum, it may actually make sense. And certainly there's some uh, promising uh, studies going on. Next slide. In addition to tocilizumab and IL-6 targeted therapies, there, have, there are some additional immunomodulators for COVID, uh, um, being treated for COVID-19, which includes steroid, of course, and IVIG, and also some plasma uh, collected from patients who are now seropositive after their infection. Again, these are all kind of you know, being in an in investigating phase and there hasn't been a true efficacy with these medications, but I'm hoping that there are more data to come in the next future so that we can learn more about it. Next slide. So in summary, again, there's different phases of virus infection from the initial virus replication phase with the local, uh, uh, local symptoms to uh, the hyperinflammatory phase. And again, we have a, some of the some promising um, therapies geared toward each stages of this infection. I'm hoping that as we learn more and do more clinical trials, we have a better targeted therapies for these patients. Next slide. Um, so the, the remaining time I'd like to talk a little bit more about um, the safety of angio, uh, ACE inhibitors as well as angiotensin receptor blockade. Um, so the, the reason why uh, there's a concern related to these medications is because this. So um, as, you can, as you can see in this figure, um, ACE inhibitor as well as angiotensin receptor blockades uh, inhibit this pathway from angiotensin 1 to 2 to angiotensin receptor, um, preventing abnormal remodeling as well as vasoconstriction. ACE2 that's expressed in the cell membrane modulates their, their activities by converting angiotens angiotensin II to the other angiotensin and leading into a more beneficial vasodilation. And as, you, as, you, as we talked about, H2 is also the receptor that the spike protein of the virus binds to and enters into the cells. So what people were concerned was that when people are treated with ACE inhibitor or ARB, this homeostasis gets interrupted, which may lead into overexpression of the ACE2 um, surface protein, making the cells more vulnerable for infection as well as worse outcome. Next slide. 
And you know, since then there have been so much research in terms of you know, how much ACE2 is expressed in different organs. And what we know so far is that ACE2 is the most heavily expressed in nasal mucosa, uh, followed by some GI mucosa. There's also some expression in the heart and some, some expression in the lungs. So probably that's why these three organs are the major organs susceptible to virus. Next slide. So the major concerns related to ACE inhibitor as, as well as ARB is first, are patients taking these drugs more likely to get infected by SARS-CoV-2? And then the second question is, are our patients infected with COVID-19 who are also concurrently taking ACE inhibitor or ARV worse off? So those are the two questions that people were uh, raising um, to the point that many patients actually called our clinic and see whether they needed to stop the medications. Next slide. So uh, luckily since two months ago, we now have some more data. Um, so um, if there has been a population-based study from Italy. So what they did is they actually looked into 6,200 patients with COVID-19 and then also looked into about matched cohort of 30,000 patients. Next slide, in Italy. And then what they, look, what they saw was that, um, you know, when they looked into the, uh, the rate of the drug therapy in these two populations, again, the cohort of patients infected with COVID-19 and a matched cohort without an infection, the use of ACE inhibitors as well as ARB were more or less the same. Again, in, in, when, you, when you look at the odds ratio of the, that's not adjusted, obviously you know, since patients with hypertension were more likely to have COVID-19, there's some increased uh, rates of use, but then when you adjust it by all blood pressure effect, you know, there's really non, um, no difference. So again, uh, a, the use of ACE inhibitors or ARB do not seem to have any association with increasing uh, increased risk of COVID and COVID-19 infection. Next slide. Uh, next slide. And then another group of researchers uh, actually from Cleveland Clinic in Ohio had an interesting uh, research. So what they did is they looked into their first 18,000 patients who came to their hospital system for COVID-19 um, testing. And out of these patients, 1,700 patients were confirmed positive. So then they looked into the, uh, the patients who were positive versus not positive and saw and see whether there's any difference in terms of the use of the ACE inhibitor or ARB. And again, as you can see in this, um, plot the first three, there was really no difference in terms of um, their likelihood to get infection among the patients who are using the ACE inhibitor versus no ACE inhibitor. So again, uh, the first, these two studies basically show that, the, that there's no increased infectivity uh, among the patients who are, treating, uh, who, are, uh, who are being treated with either ACE inhibitor or angiotensin receptor blockade. Next slide. Uh, but then again, the next question is, hey, then um, are they worse off? Are they better off? What happens? So um, again, the researchers pulled the data from um, you know, multinational 169 patients leading to 8,910 patients with COVID-19, uh, including 515 um, patients with death. Next slide. And then when you look at the bottom three, really, um, there wasn't a significant risk associated with taking this medication. So if the heart uh, odd ratio is greater than one, then there's an increased risk for mortality. If the odd ratio is less than one, then there might be decreased risk for uh, mortality. And if anything, ACE inhibitor was associated with slightly improved mortality. And there's not so much difference in, 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 with the use of ARB. And some, some interesting observation or incidental finding here it was also that those who are being treated with statin appears to be better off, although um, we still need a more data and more investigation into this. Next slide. Uh, next slide. So then um, a group of researchers in China also um, you know, looked into uh, the patients who are being treated with ACE inhibitor or ARB versus no ACE inhibitor or ARB. And, and what they actually observed was also pretty interesting. So they saw that there's actually an improved outcome 
and less uh, mortality among the patients who are being treated with ACE inhibitor or ARB versus who are not being treated with it. And so, you know, I don't know whether we can um, conclude from these studies to say ACE inhibitor or ARB is better or safer, uh, better or, um, uh, or improves the outcome, but at least we know that ACE inhibitor or ARB are not worse off. Um, and, and again, when we advise the patients, we can safely say that the infection rate as well as mortality rates are, if anything, the same among the patients um, who are being treated with ACE inhibitor or ARB versus no ACE inhibitor or ARB. And there's some data to suggest that if uh, an ACE inhibitor user ARB could actually have a potential beneficial effect or protective effect, although more data needs to be done, collected, and more studies are warranted. Next slide. So um, based on these study results, uh, both American Heart Association from the, from the US, as well as European Society of Hypertension from the Europe um, be, um, report us uh, or um, suggest that you know, patients who are already on ACE inhibitor or ARB do not stop their medication or discontinue their medication and continue them unless there's any, any reason for discontinuing such as a hypotension related to the infection. Next slide. Uh, next slide. And next slide. And again, it is really important for all of us to know that, you know, when, when we are asked from the patients, um, you know, we, we, our recommendation should be don't change and continue taking the medications. And again, more data, uh, you know, will come regarding the actual beneficial effects of these medications. Next slide. Um, so before I finish this talk, I also wanted to bring uh, your attention to one study that's been published in New England Journal of Medicine last week. So a group of researchers from uh, Northern California, Kaiser, actually looked into the rates of uh, hospitalization for acute myocardial infarction in 2019 and 2020. Uh, so as you can see in this graph, um, ever since um, there's an outbreak in COVID-19, there's a marked decrease in the rates of hospitalization for acute MI in 2020 compared to 2019. And they actually found that there is an up to 48% reduction in the overall rates of hospitalization uh, secondary to acute MI in 2020 versus 2019. You know, we don't think this is because there's actual decrease in incidence of myocardial infarction. We actually think that it's because patients out of fear of COVID-19 do not seek medical attention and just stay home. So next slide. So you know, it's also very important for us to remind our patients to medical attention, especially if they have any signs or symptoms concerning for um, acute myocardial infarction. And again, we don't want patients unnecessarily die or have a poor outcome from un unsought medical attention for their heart disease. And we do want to make sure these patients get an appropriate care. Next slide. So in summary, uh, as we discussed earlier, patients with underlying cardiovascular disease have overall poor prognosis. And those who actually suffer from myocardial injury evidenced by troponin elevation in their serum um, appear to have really a worse outcome irrespective of the underlying mechanisms. And actually more studies are warranted in terms of why these patients are having myocardial injury. And third, uh, many treatments are on the horizon, but at least we know that when that's severe, is now effective in reducing the length of hospitalization among patients with COVID-19 with potential mortality benefit. And also, again, we know that hydroxychloroquine, although there's no direct clinical uh, trial data available, uh, the large observational registry data suggests that it's not efficacious, and if anything, it may be potentially um, uh, uh, unsafe. And lastly, there's no data to support increased infectivity or worse outcome with the use of ACE inhibitor or angiotensin receptor blockades. So patients should continue to take these medications. And when you consider starting these medications, I think that you know, it could be a shared decision with the patient. And finally, it is important for us to remind all our patients to seek medical attention for any symptoms or cons uh, signs concerning for acute MI and encourage them to seek and uh, to go to the hospital despite their fear for COVID-19. 
Um, I think this is my last slide. Uh, and thank you so much for listening to my talk and I welcome any questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Ree. Wow, what a great review and um, important emphasis on the key and updated literature. We've all been hearing this message, don't stop the ACE inhibitors in ARB. So I'm glad you reiterated that and really nice landscape of therapy and how they fit into the context of the mechanism of action of the, of the infection. So thank you. We have a couple of questions. Um, the mm -hmm. first one is actually from Dr. Yu, one of our one of our other panelists. So he's gonna ask it verbally. We can unmute Dr. Yu to ask. All right, good afternoon. Um, thank you very much. Great, great talk. Um, I will wonder if you could follow up on your thoughts about hypertension itself. Um, that's actually tied into my portion of the talk quite well. What I, wanted, what I want to know is, does the level of hypertension control has any bearings in terms of patients' outcomes should they have COVID-19? We do know that uh, from observation, diabetic control seems to have a correlate that if you have worse A1C levels, your outcomes are worse. So we want to know if the analogous is the same for hypertension, and if so, uh, what do we know about that? Thank you. Um, th yeah, that, that's a great question. I'm not really sure whether there's any um, data looking into how well the blood pressure is controlled and whether that uh, has any association with um, uh, you know outcomes after COVID-19 because uh, majority of data just report a existing or history of hypertension. Um, one thing that I do uh, have some, I, I do think there's some importance related to hypertension is that if somebody has a hypertension, then that probably port, um, suggests that they have a potential underlying vascular dysfunction. And we also know that there's some uh, interesting um, interaction between uh, COVID-19 and vascular dysfunction. So I guess, uh, the, you know, the question for us to really ask is, you know, um, could vascular dysfunction uh, be different among the hypertension um, uh, treatment uh, efficacy? And could that really um, then portend a uh, different outcomes? And, you know, I think um, it, it's a really fascinating question that I don't think we have a, a actual data to, to, um, to uh, support one or the other. But I think there could be a, a, a possibility that if patients have a well-controlled hypertension, they might be better off given their improved vascular um, function related to hypertension therapies. Thank you very much. Great. And there's another question in the Q&A about the, I think, the literature source on the hydroxychloroquine data uh -huh. that people can read up more about. Um, yeah, so, um, so, you know, I would actually suggest uh, the paper from Lancet that's been published about four days ago. If you just Google Lancet hydroxychloroquine and COVID-19, that's the first paper that comes out, uh, comes out on Google. Because uh, that's really the largest data registry existing in COVID-19. Even though it didn't really make it to New England Journal of Medicine, I do think that that's really worth uh, the time, worth your attention to really read and go over the data. Because um, that that paper, uh, it actually suggests that hydroxychloroquine not only has a worse outcome, it can also lead into um, potentially fatal ventricular arrhythmia. The other paper was published in New England Journal of Medicine a couple of weeks ago and that actually had about 9,000 patients. And their conclusion was that it wasn't efficacious for treating for COVID-19, but it didn't really raise a safety concern at the time. Great. Okay, there's another um, question from Jim Adams. Your slide on mortality with and without CVD and or troponin elevations shows a 13.3% mortality in those without CVD and no, um, I think, troponin elevations. What, was this the mortality rate in hospitalized patients or ICU patients? And what is the age-related risk for these mortality statistics? Um, I'm not sure, let me actually go back to my slide. So, uh, you know, I think one uh, struggle that we have is that as we talked about uh, earlier on, the case, fatality rates uh, reported by different countries really differ a lot. Uh, but overall, um, let's see, let me, I think it's, it's slide, um, probably slide, um, 
slide 13 probably. And I'll just add that the slides will be posted on the Right Care website, rightcare.berkeley.edu after our webinar that's listed in the chat box. Yeah, so I, you know, I think this study just looked into any CBD without a, a independent of age. Um, I do think that if you add an age factor, then probably it's gonna make the graph even much worse. Um, but this cardiovascular disease only included those with uh, prior prior um, myocardial infarction or coronary artery disease, um, um, hypertension, as well as heart failure. I forgot the second question. Um, what is there age related risk for these mortality statistics? Yeah, I'm not. I'm not sure. Uh, I think, um, but I, I I'm pretty sure. Yes. Um, you know, because we, we think that even though these cardiovascular disease is an age dependent risk factor, we think that these, uh, um, uh, there's an independent risk associated with cardiovascular disease, separate from age. So if you actually add an age factor into this, then I'm pretty sure that the graph is going to be much worse. Okay, thanks. And can you, we, in our discussions, we were commenting on um, the impact of statins and the associations that we're seeing. Could yeah. you expand a little bit about on that again? You know, there's actually not a, it was an incidental finding that I saw, uh, but actually, let me see. Um, there's a really good table. Um, can, Brian, can we go to um, the slide number 36? Yes. Actually, never mind that. Uh, I want to go to the Lancet paper. So Lancet paper is uh, uh, slide number 26. Let me pull that up right now, slide number 26. And yeah. while he's pulling that up, I'm going to answer another question in the chat box and feel free to weigh in, Dr. Ree. Um, Rallo Freer asks, are there any data to suggest an association of COVID and increased incidence of stroke? Being a stroke neurologist, I will say that there is a lot of, you know, hype about it. There was that letter to the New England Journal of Medicine that published a series of cases. There are associations being reported. I don't think we yet have enough data to say that there's a relatively higher incidence, although in young patients without risk factors, mm -hmm. there are associated strokes being described. And the the idea is that it may be a similar response, the inflammatory or prothrombotic response that um, Dr. Ree was describing is also occurring in cardiovascular disease, but I don't think there's been like an excess stroke calculation that's been legitimately published in the literature yet. Um, so I think there's more to come on that. Um, Dr. Ree, feel free to add that and then answer the, the other oh, yeah. question. Yeah. yeah, stroke, I think we're just accumulating data and, yeah. and, and that hasn't been a clear association yet. And also at Stanford, we have, I guess we saw only one case. At the county, yeah. Yeah, at, at Santa Clara Valley. And, and when you go to slide 25, Brian, I'm so sorry. Um, so this is again, you know, from the largest database uh, involving 96,000 patients, the one slide be before, slide before this, yes. Uh, involving 96,000 patients. Again, this is the largest database, again, uh, um, uh, published in Lancet. And when you, when you look at statin, there appears to be a statistically significant decreased risk of death associated with the medication. But again, this study wasn't really, um, you know, specifically looking at statin. And I think this is a, a one of the incidental report that that's worth for further investigation. And, and I do think that given the uh, pleiotrophic effects of statin, including, you know, um, uh, improving the vascular health and being uh, anti-inflammatory uh, medication, you know, there could be a presumed benefit of statin in COVID-19, but I don't think there's any specific study looking into this question. I think it's it's definitely worth to explore. All right, thanks. Let's keep the questions coming in the Q&A, but we're gonna move on from Dr. Ree. Thank you again so much thank to um, Dr. Stebbins. So I briefly mentioned before, Dr. Stebbins is a professor and vice chair of clinical innovation um, with a doctorate in pharmacy, currently working at the UC San Francisco Clinical Pharmacy, but also putting in together amazing programs um, to help our patients, not just in the COVID-19 pandemic, but really using this as an opportunity to figure out how to leverage the whole healthcare system to benefit our patients, both in the post-pandemic period, but also in general for, for excellent healthcare delivery at the right time. 
and right place. And so we're going to be hearing more about uh, a very practical um, innovation that she has she has started in these times. So, um, Dr. Stevens, why don't you take it away? Thank you for being here, and just unmute yourself. With that. Thank you. Um, I love presenting at the right care. I've presented mostly in the Sacramento region, but thank you for having me here. And it is a really exciting time. I think my entire 30 some year career in pharmacy has focused on interprofessional practice and developing novel uh, team-based care for pharmacists on the care team. So um, as we all know, COVID has presented incredible challenges to the healthcare system. But also as an educator and faculty in the School of Pharmacy, we found um, intense educational challenges as well with COVID. And for those of you who know me, um, I love a good challenge. So uh, I had a personal challenge with COVID that uh, has provided me a lot of interesting opportunities. But my professional uh, challenge with COVID I'm looking at really as an opportunity to innovate and address some of the challenges we have going forward. And I look at it, next slide please, as a perfect storm. I think that um, if we look at the clinical challenge that uh, COVID presents, I wanna move past sort of the, the, the whole COVID, not just COVID cases, but what the um, COVID-19 has done in the healthcare system, and Dr. Rhee addressed this with what Kaiser saw here in Northern California with people not coming in with MIs, and it wasn't because they weren't having them, but I think it's this um, problem of this second wave of the pandemic that, it, that goes beyond COVID-19, and that's the second wave of patients who've delayed care and have uncontrolled chronic diseases and complications because they were too fearful to come in uh, during the COVID crisis or the care wasn't available to them. So, so excuse me. So if we, um, we look at that, we see that um, Kaiser's terrified of this second wave because they know that people who survive that MI are going to be coming in with their heart failure, et cetera. So that second wave is gonna come in. I was uh, speaking to Dr. Stock this morning and she made a comment that the second wave has already hit cardiology uh, at UCSF. Last month, they saw five to 10 echoes a day, which was definitely not normal for them. And now suddenly it's 70 to 80 echoes per day and that is, this backlog of deferred tests and visits that we're going to see in this second wave. So that's one of the first points of the, uh, the perfect storm. The second point um, really is this whole idea, next slide, that um, our professional students had all their rotations canceled, our medical school, nursing school, pharmacy school, dental school, I'm not sure if this is true on other people's screens, but Marilyn appears to be frozen. Uh, um, yes, she is frozen on mine as well, Hattie. Oh, thank you, Dr. Stock, for uh, for letting us know. I think that it looks like Marilyn, Marilyn, can we can hear? Can you hear me? Now yeah, I can. Can you hear me? Now I can. Okay. All right, so um, you know our rotation stopped because of lack of PPE and many sites weren't capable of taking students, professional students on rotation. And we also knew that our students were very eager to help in any way possible during the COVID pandemic. Um, the third point of our perfect storm was that our clinics were beginning to roll out video visits and telehealth. And they discovered that um, while patients were fearful of coming into clinic, um, 
probably the bigger fear were our providers in engaging in video visits because they hadn't been doing that uh, in the past. And so the, we went almost overnight at UCSF in our primary care clinics from about a two and a half percent uh, video visit to 70 percent uh, within a week during the COVID crisis. So we had this, you know, the students not working, we had the healthcare system and this second wave that everybody was anticipating and people delaying care, as well as telehealth emerging. Next slide, please. So we decided, I met with several of my um, colleagues in our interprofessional committees and decided, what could we do? We had to figure out something to do very quickly, but could we create an elective that provided interprofessional learning for medical students and pharmacy students that could address some of these needs? So the first was we wanted to get our students working together in a true clinical environment um, before they got on the wards and before they got in, uh, out into practice so that they could practice their communication skills. We also knew that many of our patients who were lost to follow-up, we had medication issues. So through a thorough medication reconciliation, could we identify medication issues, including access and adherence issues? We also uh, wanted to figure out what social determinants of health, what, where they were playing in this crisis and whether they impacted um, access to technology and their impact on chronic disease in the context of the global pandemic. And we also thought it would be important to administer um, some health screenings to our patients who hadn't been engaged in care when they should have been uh, for depression, interpersonal violence, and tobacco use. And uh, could we do this providing telephone or video outreach to vulnerable populations and coordinate TCP follow-up visits, either in person as we opened up or virtually through telehealth or video visits. Next slide. So we, uh, we quickly found students that were eager to be our um, pilot students. And uh, we decided as we were using Zoom as our platform for video visits that we would have the students create a meeting room and we would use that throughout the, the rotation uh, on Zoom. And the, the students would call the patients uh, from Zoom using the invite uh, by phone option. But we soon discovered there were problems with this because patients thought uh, if you were outreaching with a cold call, they, many of them mistook this for a scam because the first thing it says is, this is a Zoom call, please hit one. So many of them were um, hanging up. So uh, we decided to use another technology, the Doximity Dialer, which used a UCSF phone number that the patient may have been familiar with. And we informed the patient, called them, informed them, that we would be calling them back for a video visit in one minute and were they okay with that. Uh, what we discovered very quickly in this video visit was that oftentimes the patient just said, you know what, we don't need to do video, let's just chat on the phone. So we found that we were doing multiple things with our, um, with our outreach that it, patients didn't need it to be video, it could have been telephonic and they were just looking for the simplest solution. Next slide. So how did we uh, structure it? Well, we structured it with a 30-minute huddle. Um, our elective was three days a week for from one o'clock to four o'clock in the afternoon, and most of that was because of preceptor time. We were all doing this on the fly, so we were trying to figure out how to do this um, as quickly as possible. So we would huddle from one to 3.30, and the pharmacy and medical students um, met with their medicine and pharmacy preceptors via Zoom. We determined which patients they would contact, um, and we used the providers that were our preceptors, their patients, and we discussed any challenges or obstacles that the students anticipated, and we did a 15-minute interprofessional topic discussion. 
Um, and some of the things we did, we discussed um, mental health in the era of COVID, and we looked at that, uh, as well as uh, social, social determinants of health and what was going on in our underserved populations. Next slide. Uh, from 1.30 to 3.30, we checked out as preceptors and went back to our normal work. And the students then were given free reign to, um, to contact patients and sort of allow the visits to be uh, organic in their nature and um, determine what the needs of the, the patients were. So some of the things we gave them as suggestions is if the patient wanted more COVID basics, they had resources to do that. They were, we asked them to try to get a medication um, uh, reconciliation done to address adherence and access. Uh, what were the barriers for them to coming in for care or for receiving care via video visit? And then we did some screening for depression and anxiety, food insecurity, housing insecurity, and inter, um, personal violence. And then we addressed their barriers to telehealth because the ultimate goal of this entire outreach was to get the patient in for a visit. Next slide. We then um, basically would set up very quick dot phrases for the students to use uh, with the telephone encounter. So uh, we had them quickly documenting everything that was going on based on where the call went not every call got everything done. And so um, in their time, they created a note um, using dot phrases and um, worked with each other to figure out how they were going to handle this. We didn't uh, get involved at all. We let the medical student and pharmacy student figure this out. And then we had them CC the chart note to the primary care provider as well as the scheduling pool to get the, the visit scheduled. Next slide. And then at our huddle, we did a 30 minute huddle at the end where we all met together again. We discussed the cases and we asked the students to do a quick, we were trying to teach them about how to present quickly to busy providers. So we had them use the ASPAR method and we had them highlight the challenges, the lessons learned and what exactly they wanted the provider to address at their visit and if they were successful in getting the visit. Uh, and then we would return to any learning points or didactic topics for reinforcement, and then we plan for the next day. Next slide. And our Zoom visits look like this, like everybody else's Zoom visits. Next slide. And I think what we learned, we learned so much in our first couple of weeks. Um, our students told us that, that although we simulate uh, interprofessional education and have activities throughout their curricula, um, this it really doesn't hi highlight the skill sets of the other professions and they learn so much from each other and how to work with each other in the future. Um, before they said they didn't know what practicing at the top of their licenses meant and what it really meant to work interprofessionally and this taught them um, how to do that without anyone sort of watching them or interfering. They said that they would approach each other when they went on rotations in a very different way. And they really tasked us and challenged us to incorporate real patient scenarios earlier in their curriculum instead of the simulated cases that we give them. They also proved to us that interprofessional telehealth was possible and it can be made seamless to the patient and it can be telehealth or it can be video visits. It didn't have to be one or the other. Next slide. And I just thought I would give you a couple of, of quotes that the students gave us. They felt that telehealth was so important and they thought that this elective uh, was a very strong introduction to it. Um, the medical students said, usually we're responsible for the history and physical and meds are just one part of that. This helped me to see the medications in a larger picture. It helps knowing that the information is important to convey to my pharmacy colleagues who can look into it more deeply and help me understand it. This model of care helped me think about how we work together in a team-based model, how we would work together to co-manage patients and achieve a goal. 
And I think that um, I'm not, you can read the last one, but I think even more importantly is what were the patient's reactions? We had one patient that we called that was lost to follow up, who when we called, he was in the ICU. So clearly he was somebody who uh, could have uh, you know, received care earlier and may have avoided an ICU stay. We had another patient who had several strokes and was um, bed bound uh, in a nursing home who was incredibly depressed because every activity that they were able to participate in in the nursing home had been shut down. And they were locked, based, as they said, locked in their room with no interaction and they had a roommate they didn't get along with and they were very much in need of some resources. And our patient today, uh, just uh, before this talk, uh, let us know that they are not coming in for their screening scan for a um, lung mass because they can't guarantee, no one can guarantee them that they won't get COVID. And uh, so that was a real challenge for our students to talk to them, to at least get them to agree to a vi video visit so they could have that conversation with their provider. This was someone who is very, very fearful of COVID and wants to delay care, but agreed to a video visit. So I will stop there, but uh, we'll tell you that all of us, uh, no one had time to put this on their plate but every faculty that has been involved with this has found it incredibly rewarding. And uh, part of it is from our student learnings, but also what our patients are teaching us about uh, how they are reacting to this pandemic and how it affects their, uh, their chronic care. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Sevens. What a practical you know, way to really leverage the whole system especially when students are yearning for more to do. And it's gonna last, you know, far beyond this time. And I think it's so critical, right? Before that second wave hits or before we're having to increase procedures in the hospital, let's keep, keep people out of the hospital and do what Absolutely. we do best with the medications we know work. So thank you. Um, are there any questions? You guys can type them in the q and I I don't know if people can raise their hand. Um, and get unmuted if there are anyone. Hi, this is Hattie. I, Marilyn, thank you for that very inspiring, quick talk to our group and always being such a great leader in the Right Care Initiative. I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit more about uh, how you're searching your electronic medical records for those who are at high risk who need proactive outreach. Yeah, um, we actually have. Um, a team doing that in our primary care clinics who are looking for people who have missed visits, but they're also um, scanning for high-risk diagnoses, so cardiovascular disease, uh, people with uh, mental health issues, um, and uh, other chronic diseases, So there, and, and age is another screening factor. So um, right now, because we're small, we're working with two providers, so we're, uh, they are given these lists of patients that they're encouraged to follow up with or have their medical assistants follow up with, and that's the list that we're using for, um, for our outreach. Thank you. Thanks. There's another question from Raul Freer. Um, have the teams been able to secure follow-up visits and at, at what you'd consider an acceptable rate? So yeah, hi, Rallo. That's great. But what about after? Yeah, hi, Rallo. How are you, old friend? Uh, uh, I would say that they've. We've only been at this. This is our fourth week, so um, we have been a hundred percent successful in getting our patients to agree to the first video visit with their primary care provider. Um, uh, but I will tell you what I think our students are learning are these people really just need someone to talk to. So they're not getting to as many patients as they think they will in their short time because people want to talk. Um, and they're willing to engage in a video visit. They're not getting people yet that are interested in coming back for in-person visits. So we aren't at a second visit yet. We're just at that first visit to get them back in. So it sounds like there's more to come. 
Thank you again Absolutely. so much, Dr. Stebbins. Um, please, everyone can continue to use the Q&A function and we're trying to respond to the questions there. You can see the answers in the answered section. But let's um, keep moving forward to Dr. Yu, another well-known face to the Right Care Initiative. <laughs> so I feel he needs no introduction, but um, since he, he's a regular at our Bay Area Right Care Initiative. But as you know, he's board certified in family medicine, has worked on the front lines, but is also a leader and chief, uh, and chief quality officer at the Palo Alto Medical Foundation, along with a regional leader um, for quality improvement. He has a, many efforts um, in improving healthcare systems, population health, and again, innovations. And so we're gonna actually hear about um, what is being pushed forward now as we again, begin to reopen. So Dr. Yu, why don't you take it away? Oh, thank you very much, Norelli. I do apologize. Uh, my company doesn't give us webcam, so you will not see my <laughs> face. You'll hear my voice. I had to bring my personal device next time to do so. And again, my apologies for that. Anyways, kudos to the programmers of putting the sequence of talk because what I'm going to talk about will follow very nicely with the previous two speakers because at Palo Alto Medical Foundation right now, our, um, as, uh, the, uh, uh, as we open up right now, the biggest challenge we face is um, this uh, second wave of delayed care and then the barriers that we see. So I have two parts to my section over here. One is that I want to share with you a little bit of statistics that we have gleaned to show the vast amount of deferred care that has happened, and it's quite striking. And then uh, tell you a little bit about what we are doing at Palo Alto Medical Foundation and Sutter Health to really address the patient fear of coming in. It is real. It is pervasive. And in fact, in my clinical practice, that's the number one question I'm getting from my patients. Doc, do I really need to do this now? Can I wait for this to be done when we go back to normal, which the normal they're saying is a pre-COVID no normal. And from my take, that is, we are a long ways off from that. And again, um, so we're gonna go through that uh, journey with you today. So next slide. Um, next slide, please. One of the things we know when the shelter in place uh, came into being, uh, people had to, uh, were told to put off things that are not urgent. So our group, uh, as many of the health systems in our area, did the right thing, which is we really canceled our schedules for elective care and only opened it for emergent care to prepare for, uh, back then, the anticipated surge of COVID patients. Now, when that happened, uh, it was pretty dramatic, the swings in our volumes in our health system that we are all learning about. But what I'm going to drill down is really looking at uh, some of the healthcare services that were deferred. And one of the most striking ones is pediatric vaccines. Uh, next slide, please. If you look at this next graph over here, this is tracking the amount of vaccine, pediatric vaccines that were uh, delivered and given. And you can see right there when the uh, national emergency was declared and the precipitous drop in all categories of vaccine to the point of 40% or more. Next slide. Uh, this is just another view of the same information. This is now broken down by age brackets. Uh, we want, uh, there was a push, particularly in the pediatric community to continue and urge parents to bring their infants in so that they, uh, uh, they have no immunity. Um, they're developing it, they needed the vaccine to protect them. And they were a little more successful there, but it was a clear drop off of kids uh, in the preschool, school age kids of not coming in as these graphs show. The light ones are the older ones, the blue bars are the uh, younger ones. Next slide. Now, to the extent it was quite dramatic, and we uh, here in Silicon Valley, our public health department, um, one would say is one of the more uh, conservative ones. And I think we are one of the last counties that still has the longer shelter in place. But what was striking in light of that is that our um, public health official in the state of California, Dr. Sonia Engel, noted this point and actually released a press release last week to say, uh, well, yes, COVID-19 is our main priority right now. Please don't forget, uh, don't ignore the fact that if you have children, they have vaccines, uh, they are considered important, and please make sure they get those services done. 
So this is just a direct quote from that press release that just came out last week. Next sign. Now, even more dramatic that we see is the drop-off of cancer screening. Not surprising. Again, this is considered elective. But again, putting in context of the numbers, it is quite striking. Um, so this data that you see here is from the Epic Health Research Network that just published a few weeks ago. And this is looking at 39 organizations across the country using Epic. And what they are looking at here are completion rates for these type of cancer services. Next slide, please. Um, what you see here are the three common ones, breast cancer screening up in the top, colon cancer screening in the middle, and cervical cancer screening in green on the bottom. And what is noticeable there are the numbers that are in uh, those oval boxes there. And what that represents from their baseline is a decrease on average about 90%, 90% of these screening rates that was done before, uh, before compared to prior years to now, giving it a sense of the volume of the deferred care that has happened. Next slide. Uh, next slide, please. Um, this one I threw in here because I want to tie into the Right Care Initiative. And this also happens in chronic care as well. Um, this is a slide over here that came from the Journal of Science and Technology where they were looking at diabetic patients and looking at their outcomes that have COVID and looking at length of stay and mortality and shows that based on your A1C threshold, uh, you do seem to have different outcomes such that if you're, uh, you're considered not as optimally controlled, your outcomes are worse. Next slide. Uh, next slide. This, uh, Dr. Rhee has mentioned already, the same graph that we see over here that, you know, heart attack rates we don't think are different. But even in patients with truly what we consider emergencies, day two, like the chronic care, uh, like the preventive care patients are deferring care. 49, 48% uh, drop in the volume of those seen in emergency rooms. And this is from Kaiser Northern California here in our county. And uh, this is similar, it was reproduced similarly in other health systems, including Italy, which was, has been publicized as well. Uh, next slide, please. Um, what was the drop off on patient visits, uh, patient encounters? Next slide. So this data comes from Estrada Decision Technology. Again, this is not published data. Uh, this is a uh, basically, an, an EMR system that's not EPIC that tracks the usage of uh, visits with their health, uh, with their uh, system across the nation. And this is dividing them by condition, the drop off of visits pre and post the national emergency declaration. So you can see for some of these care, virtually the drop off is near 100%. Um, but on average, these things are uh, the drop off is about two-thirds to three-fourths of the volume, which as you have read, that is creating a financial uh, challenge for a lot of healthcare systems, uh, particularly those who are on a fee-for-service-based system. And again, uh, one of the uh, uh, nuances that we are dealing with right now, but again, putting in context of these numbers uh, gives you a dramatic sense of the drastic change in behavior and access to care that's happened because of COVID. Next slide. So um, we know that patients are afraid to come in. So what our system is trying to do is to learn a little bit about where the patient's perspectives are right now and then what can we do to address their concerns in a way how they will be willing to engage us. So as our previous speaker has mentioned, uh, I'm very grateful to hear that they have a 100% take rate after their uh, students were able to engage with these patients to accept a video visit. Um, from our experience over here, it's uh, the patients don't want to come in. They think that coming to our facilities uh, is going to cause them to cause COVID. And how are we going to do, how are we going to address that? So this is the second part of my talk. Next slide, please. 
So these are some research that are uh, been deployed. Uh, NRC is one of um, uh, the uh, companies that uh, look at uh, patient experience scores and all that, and the Burl Institute is another one that a lot of us know. But essentially, they do say the same thing, and the key points are um, on the bottom, on the on the on the left hand side, uh, demonstrating that patients think that if they come in, they're going to catch COVID. Seventy one percent of the patients would prefer a separate waiting for sick patients versus other patients to keep them segregated. And then there's a vast amount of information happening over there. The good thing is that these patients still look at us as healthcare providers as a trusted source of information to help with them. So for, the, for us here at Sutter Health and Palo Alto Medical Foundation, what we're working on is really about the language and messaging that we want to get to to address those concerns so that patients who have deferred their care, and we really don't think they should defer it any further, are be willing to come in and they can, we can do our best to calm their fears, to know that uh, we have their back and we are going to try our best to keep them safe for them to access the care that, we, that they need. Next slide. Um, this is some of the research that we have done internally uh, to understand where our patients are, and we're using this information directly to feed into our outreach campaigns and our messaging to our patients, which I'm going to show you a little bit. But I think the telling box uh, you see is on the right-hand side. Uh, the majority of the patients are worried about exposure. Uh, um, they are worried about their quality of care being compromised because of this. Uh, they don't want to come in because they want to do their part to avoid using healthcare resources to allow patients that need it to use it more, so very altruistic as well. And, and other nuances as such. So again, we know that patients are not homogeneous and each one of them may have their particular nuances based on many, many factors, uh, their age perhaps, their socioeconomic background, uh, their cultural background as well. And we serve a very diverse population here in Santa Clara County. So part of what we wanted to do is to understand these different perspectives and then, then create messaging to them so they, uh, we can uh, address their fears in a way that we can achieve the action activity that we want, which is for them not to de delay their care uh, more than they need to. Next slide. So one of the solutions obviously is virtual care. However, um, what we have observed that while uh, we actually have a virtual care practice at Palo Alto Medical Foundation of which 95% of the visits are conducted virtually, so we know it can work. Um, however, what is medically possible and what patients are willing to accept uh, do vary. And we have to be sensitive that at the end of the day, we really want to provide options for our patients, different ways of engaging us that best meets where they are over there. And as such, originally we thought, well, we'd be flipping, for instance, our primary care clinics from in-persons to virtual, and then we can reallocate the clinic space that we have for something else. However, what we're seeing right now is that in reality, I think um, the flip to virtual care may not be as quickly as we want um, despite the fact that, at least for right now, a lot of the regulatory and payment barriers are released, uh, are relieved, at least temporary for right now. And by the way, a lot of us here, including my organization, are amping up our advocacy efforts to ensure the emergency declarations and uh, that provided us to do telemedicine for those that we need to stay in place will continue to be in place. So we'll see how that plays out. Next slide. So what I'm showing here is actually a survey that just came out a couple weeks, uh, actually literally last week from AMGA. AMGA stands for American Medical Group Association, of which uh, many large health systems um, and medical groups are members of. And they surveyed the membership to look at, well, where were you were before COVID in terms of in-person and virtual care? Where are you now and where do you think you're gonna go? So blue is in person and green is virtual. 
And I'm going to concentrate on the left-hand column, which is uh, uh, basically primary care. We do know a lot of primary care visits can be done virtually. However, um, our um, groups like us feel that we're going to end up where about, about, about a fourth to maybe a third of the care will be done virtually. And that's the largest segment among the different grouping of medical specialties that you can see. Obviously, care that requires us uh, taking tissue samples from patients or having us to do an exam on the patient will require in-person steps, a lot of procedure things. There's no way you can do it virtually. Um, some of the cognitive things you can. So the mix may not be as, as, as big over there. And I think this is important for us to know as we evolve our healthcare delivery system, uh, we have to take this, this pace of change into account. So virtual care, in other words, may not be the, um, as big of the uh, lever that we would want because of a variety of reasons. So there's still a need, in other words, the take-home message over here that I think there are still need for patients to come to see us, and uh, their patients still prefer to see us, but they're not going to come until they feel safe. Next slide. So how are we going to re-engage patients? Um, so from our perspective, we're taking a two-prong approach, and the tagline I'm just going to give you at the beginning, uh, so you'll know, I think the two questions all of us have to answer are these two. One. It's how we keep you safe when you come see us. That's one. And two, how do we deliver a compelling message of saying, please don't delay needed care any further. So don't delay care and how we keep you safe. So those are the two prong messaging approach that we're trying to develop, test and engage our patients. Next slide. So here's a visual, this is not from Sutter, but this is done by the Emergency Design Collective, and this is in the safety space, is that what we found out is that by telling our patients we keep you safe is insufficient for a lot of them. In other words, they just can't take their word. Uh, they are, I mean, they want to trust, but they want to verify data. Uh, they want to know exactly how. Not all patients, but enough of the patients do, and this is feedback we're getting from our patient advisors as well. What exactly are you doing to keep me safe? Um, I see what happens when I go to grocery stores, what they're doing, but I think healthcare facilities need to do a lot more. Exactly what are you doing? So this is a, uh, a visual uh, from the Emergency Design Collective, and this is uh, available for people to use, basically giving you visual snapshots about the different things that we do. And um, for those of us who work in healthcare systems, uh, these are typical things. We're screening people, temperature checks, masking, cleaning a lot, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Next slide. So here's an example of what we're starting to do um, is uh, Sutter Health, uh, like many of our health systems in Santa Clara County, we use Epic, so we have the ability to send uh, messages to our patients on the portal. So this just came out just last week because as uh, a governor allow us to move further into uh, opening, uh, we leverage that to tell, hey, um, and we know that patients didn't want to come in because they didn't think their care was emergent or urgent, but now is the time to let them know we're here for you. The doors are open. Please start to access us. Um, so I think message one is to let them know, hey, we are open. Some of them thought we're closed. <laughs> then the next thing we want to do is uh, what are we doing to keep them safe? Next slide. So this, uh, we are uh, starting to deploy in our clinics over here, is to go into very more, a little more granular detail about the various things that we're doing to keep you safe in a checklist format for patients. Again, we realize not all patients want to know all of this, but there's enough of them that want to. Um, this is meant to be, this is a visual that will be for patients that go into the building, they will be able to see this and see what we're doing. And we're also taking this and folding this into language that we're going to use with our outreach team, such that if a patient says, oh, I'm afraid to come in, but we're here to keep you safe. Let me give you, let you know what we're doing and answer your questions to try to assuage that part for you. 
The other part that we're doing, and um, I don't have any visuals to show you yet is there, is that we understand that patients who are parents who have kids that have vaccines who are delaying care will need a different message than for patients who are um, need colon cancer screening or cervical cancer screening. Likewise, patients who have uncontrolled hypertension, uh, diabetes will need a different uh, message about why not to delay care compared to those with uh, preventive conditions. And that's one of the reasons why I'd ask Dr. Rhee about uncontrolled hypertension, whether there's any evidence that we can use to fold into the language uh, that could help us uh, guide, say, hey, um, like for diabetes, one of the nudges that we're planning to deploy is that we, under, we are seeing that if, uh, patients with poorly controlled diabetes um, tend to have worse outcomes yeah, should they contract COVID-19, let us help you optimize your control now, get things checked now, so that you're better prepared as we go into um, the fall flu season or if there's a second or third wave of COVID coming. So again, we want to align our messaging that's consistent with what the uh, literature and what the science shows and do it in a way that helps to address patients' fears and concerns in a way that they will engage us. Um, the last thing I would mention that we are also doing some modeling studies um, to try to estimate the uh, disease burden that will be coming as patients continue to delay their care as a way to help us plan interventions and efforts on that. And when, uh, when that comes out and modeling comes out, we also plan to fold that into engagement pieces to hopefully do our part to help nudge patients who are reluctant to come in or they feel that it's okay to defer their care till whenever, um, try to balance that in a way to help them uh, get their needed care now uh, in a place that uh, we're keeping them safe uh, as a way to keep them healthy. Again, we're in the business of keeping patients healthy so that we collectively can uh, stay strong and also help our systems to weather through this COVID crisis as it goes forward. Um, and in a way that helps to uh, meet where patients are and help them understand that this is, this, utter, uh, this is the collective way of how we're keeping them healthy and keeping them safe. So on that note, I'll stop and I'll be happy to take any questions. Thank you. Next slide. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Yu. Very practical things you're all doing at Sutter in, in sort of evidence-based and informed based on the data that's out there. I think it's something that we've all been hearing from our patients and you're really getting at a deep dive to, to try to help convince our patients that you know it's okay to come in when, when you need to. Um, and that complements well for those that just won't, uh, the kinds of mechanisms um, that Dr. Stebbins uh, mentioned as well. Are there any questions for Dr. Yu? Um, I didn't see any in the post. If not, uh, that's okay. We can have um, some little bit of Q&A at the end and we can keep moving forward. Um, we have Dr. Flynn next. Thanks, Dr. Yu. We have Dr. Flynn no next, problem. who you've heard, Regional Medical Director of Blue Shield of California, and really the co one of the co-founders of the Right Care um, UBP and a big supporter of us here at Silicon Valley. Thank you. Um, so you're gonna, I'm just gonna have you jump right in since we're running on the end of time here to do your few minutes on what's, uh, what you guys have been focusing on over at Blue Shield. Thanks, Norelli. Hi folks, Scott Flynn, Regional Medical Director at Blue Shield of California. Just wanted to go over a few things that we've been doing to uh, help folks through this pandemic. Next slide, please. As many of you are aware, we're helping to support the state efforts by sharing resources and partnering with the Department of Public Health to expand testing. Uh, that's one of the linchpins of getting the economy back open and things moving again, uh, trying to get that working. And uh, our company has been key and integral in that effort, uh, trying to secure supplies and, and get the uh, testing available. As you know, it's both um, testing for the disease itself with the PCR test, but also the antibody test and trying to figure out what the best way that is to do those and, and what that will actually mean. Um, there's no really approved test yet that uh, 
uh, we can rely on for the antibody test, but uh, hopefully that will be coming soon. Uh, we've helped members access care by expanding telehealth benefits and waiving copays, and that's both for telemedicine and telebehavioral health. I mean, you all have probably seen the data that shows that the amount of anxiety that has gone up, uh, anxiety prescriptions has greatly increased over the last few months, um, as has prescriptions for depression medicines, but the biggest increase has been in anxiety medicines. And uh, we've seen quite a bit of uptake in the telebehavioral health side, too. So that's that's been a, an interesting uptake that's happened. Uh, we are addressing COVID through outreach to our high-risk members. Uh, there, are, there are members, there are uh, providers, patients, but there are members. And so we've identified folks that are high risk based on the literature and, and a lot of the stuff we've been talking about today and how it's come out and uh, trying to make sure they're getting the care they needed. That big drop off on MIs and what people are seeing, making sure folks aren't hiding somewhere and not getting the care they need because they're afraid. We have helped providers with over 200 million in programs. Um, some of that is uh, for guarantees uh, or for forwarding payments uh, ahead of time to try to help them get through the rough patch we're going through right now. We've also decreased administrative burdens. Uh, we've decreased our um, need for prior auth for when folks are transitioning levels of care from hospitals to SNFs and LTACs and those kind of things. Uh, also increased our prior auth time instead of 120 days up to 180 days so people aren't having to unnecessarily resubmit paperwork. We've also given in the community with grants and partnership uh, lots of focus on the underserved communities. I, you know, it's interesting when you see some of these uh, pockets and what's going on and how much of this is um, regional, how much of it is resources and how much it is socioeconomic. And uh, it'll be interesting to see after how all this plays out, uh, what the influence of that is on stuff. But we certainly have been actively engaged in that. Next slide, please. So along what other folks have said, what, what does the future hold? What, how is this going to change? And this is a seminal event in our lives, obviously. And what's it going to make for how we move forward? Um, folks are delaying care, obviously. Um, but also think about what's happened with the employment status with so many millions losing um, their jobs and potentially their coverage with it or the coverage is going to change. Uh, let's say you were employed by a small business um, and now you've lost your job and then you can either get insurance three ways, uh, through the exchange, uh, through COBRA, or uh, if you end up on Medi-Cal. So that's going to greatly affect how things, uh, how folks access employment going forward, or access health insurance going forward. For providers, obviously, been a loss of revenue. And if that follows through with uh, a lot of folks losing their insurance and not getting reemployed quickly, you're going to have a big change in your payer mix, uh, just like we're having a change in our membership. Um, a lot of folks now are, again, losing that, that small business um, basis. Uh, the, uh, our membership in, uh, on the insurance side, we're looking at that going down in that uh, line of business, but potentially increases in the Medi-Cal and the exchange program. So we'll see how that all, all fleshes out. And then, <clears throat> obviously, as we've been talking about a lot today, an opportunity to improve our, improve our care models using virtual solutions telebehavioral health, telemedicine, uh, what can you use, not use. Uh, obviously, you still need hands-on for some things, but how will they all, all um, flesh out as we go forward? And then really um, uh, what, what needs to follow is the payment and how that will change. Um, and uh, the regulations on that from Medicare, in addition to how the different health plans will work on that, will be interesting to see how that evolves going forward. Um, obviously, one of the things we're worried about is the anticipated pent-up demand for services. Uh, we've heard some of that already about the echoes with the cardiology and uh, what will that mean for us, especially now that we are losing membership, but our costs are going to skyrocket. So we're very tentative about seeing what's going to happen in the next upcoming months. And obviously, for everyone, the continuing challenges, uncertainty, uh, and the need to continue COVID precautions. Uh, is this evolving? How are things happening? We just had a big weekend where there was a lot of folks in close proximity to each other, but it was out in the sunlight. So what's going to happen? Are we going to see a big second wave or not? How is this all going to play out? And then what happens this winter? So um, it's interesting times. May you live in interesting times, ancient curse. And uh, we are certainly um, 
uh, living it now. And, and uh, no one has a playbook for this. We're making it up as we go. And um, I'm really heartened by seeing how everyone's leaning into this and helping out. Next slide. And Thank that's you. Uh, all I have. Thank you so much, Dr. Flynn. And I do feel like you know, we have been so supported by all aspects of care as providers, including the health plans. And I know everyone's hurting right now and it really helps that everyone's, as you said, leaning in to provide the best care possible in the uncertain times. So thanks for all that you've been doing. Um, any questions for Dr. Flynn? I you? have a quick question for uh, Scott Flynn. I remember you talking about uh, what a great experience you had when you were medical director of Arch Medical Group with Mary Ellen Leahy as your lead nurse partner in doing proactive outreach. Could you just talk a little bit about how that uh, experience might um, benefit others at this uh, critical time? Yeah, Hattie, I, I think I know what you're asking for. Um, again, and we're doing this uh, from Blue Shield right now is trying to identify those members who might be at higher risk of having complications if they do get exposed and making sure their needs are being taken care of. Um, we know a lot of our partner provider organizations are doing the same thing. Um, it's sort of risk gratifying folks based on what we know, uh, who's at higher risk for a poor outcome from this and reaching out to them, making sure they're following the guidelines and also seeing if they have any resource needs, uh, any questions they have for how to do, how to manage uh, through this, navigate through this trying time. Hey, Scott, thank you very much. And you here, um, it's time back to my talk about the advocacy part. Uh, what will it take for Blue Shield to make permanent the telehealth coverage expansions they granted during this emergency period? And uh, how likely it is that the payment parity for telehealth to in-person visits will remain going forward? Thank you. Yeah, those are two great questions. One is, uh, it's interesting, we actually had telehealth as part of our benefit before COVID. So for us, it wasn't too much of a of an issue at all in terms of paying for it. Um, the things obviously it had to loosen up a little bit, which Medicare did also, was loosening requirements for what the platforms were with following HIPAA rules, uh, video teleconferencing, what what constituted a real visit or not. So for us, that wasn't too hard. Uh, what will be interesting to see, um, you know, as you go forward, these are. Right now, we're reimbursing televisits the same as we are in-person visits. Um, will that stick? Uh, as you know, with a regular visit, your RVU is broken up into three components, a professional component, facility component, and the liability component. Um, that facility component is completely different with uh, televisit. So what does that mean for us going future, going forward? Don't know. Uh, what will the platforms be required? You know, one of the things to think about Medicare Advantage if you're doing a visit now for Medicare Advantage, you can get paid for it, but it doesn't count for your RAF score. Okay, so how does that, what, what is that gonna change to in the future too? Um, uh, so that, that's a very provocative question. We'll see how it shakes out. I and mean, we certainly don't have the answers yet, uh, but you're certainly asking the right questions. No problem, we're in it together, thank you. Norelli, I think you're on mute. Thank you, Scott. Oh, uh, thanks. Yeah, here we go. <laughs> Sorry. Thanks, okay, Scott. yeah, let's go to the next slide. I was just saying we can move it along. Thank you again, Scott. I think I gave you an honorary degree there. Uh, all right. So, um, oh, I'm up next. So I was, I was, I think what I'm going to talk about really has already been addressed by a lot of um, our, our speakers, but how Stanford is also thinking about reopening, which um, is really along the lines of what Eddie you mentioned that we that we really need to listen to patients and understand um, what are the concerns about coming in and who really does need to come in because as it stands right now we can still do telehealth with the grace that we've been doing and so at Stanford um, I think sheltering in place is still uh, the rule this is the county that we're in and we're thinking about how to do this carefully in terms of how do I keep my patients safe and that number one question of how am I not going to contract COVID when I come in even for an ambulatory visit if it's required. Um, each, each group is really thinking about what is essential and what cannot be delayed any further. So before it was just emergency, but now what's urgent, what's been waiting and, and who do we need to bring in? 
And for those patients, how do we protect them, particularly as uh, I think some specifics are thinking about the waiting rooms and social distancing in the waiting room. Uh, no visitor policies or having visitors wait in their car outside so they don't take up that valuable space in the waiting room, um, the clinic room, and even thinking about providers and how much space we as providers will require to stay safe and social distance. I think that um, all these questions are, are out there and that each group is taking precautions accordingly. Um, at Stanford, we are doing healthcare uh, provider testing for PCR and um, serologies, which uh, I think, you know, it's a mixed kind of impact, right? We can know whether people are positive on their PCR, but um, we still, like Scott Flynn mentioned, don't know how to interpret the serologies. And I feel that's more of sort of trying to market a reassurance to, to patients, but it doesn't take away from the fact that there are other people who are coming into those same offices that could be sick. And so the universal screening is really critical. The separation of patients who are PUIs or COVID positive and caring for them in a separate clinic. We have the Crown Clinic at Stanford compared to non-COVID um, or suspected patients. And then just continuing on a case by case basis for those that are positive, figuring out how can we pr provide them care while keeping the rest of the community safe. So again, the same kinds of efforts that we're hearing from Sutter um, are taking place at Stanford with the added testing. I think another thing that we're thinking about as healthcare providers, how to protect ourselves is also um, the PPE. The PPE has been pretty available, thankfully in our region. Uh, but also understanding how do we not overutilize this resource? What are the procedures that do require and what PPE? There's no guidelines about this. And so coming together um, in, our, in our national organizations to think about it, but also locally in, in what capacity we have um, to help again, reassure the patients and reassure the providers that we're gonna remain safe. I think the bottom line at Stanford is for the next month or two, we're gonna continue with primarily telehealth we project no more than 25% of our visits will be in person um, to address those urgencies, emergencies, and to really maintain that social distancing. And that will continue to offer telehealth as much as we can while encouraging emergencies to come to the ER or, or be seen face-to-face. -face. Um, okay, I don't wanna take up too much more time. I believe, uh, who's next? Is it Dr. Stock? Yes. Are you here, Dr. Stock? All right, Emily, she has not texted co-chair. Yeah, Risa. Hi, Neurali. Hi, everyone. Here she is. Uh, Good. Here I am. Um, as you, as uh, Marilyn Stebbins uh, correctly uh, mentioned, <laughs> our numbers have greatly increased. And today in our like echo lab, we are reading 76 echoes, uh, very few providers. So. Uh, excuse me for not being um, totally available, but um, we are here. Let me um, first uh, start with uh, what I think is one of the key points that were discussed today. I will try to share my screen. Oh, so um, I can't share my screen. However, I do want to mention um, as we move forward into this phase where we are confronted with this second wave of um, challenge with more patients seeking care, um, I want to, um, I was wondering if at UCSF we had seen this decrease in cardiovascular hospitalizations thinking that people were avoiding uh, getting care. And one of the um, things that I was able to look at today was UCSF cath lab activations for STEMI. Compared to January, 2020, where we had 17 cath lab activations at, um, at our main campus, we had nine in March and just two in April. And now in May so far, we've had 11. So it seems like people are slowly getting the courage to come out and seek care. It is still very concerning that they are not coming um, or reticent to seek care for um, 
cardiovascular complications that if delayed could increase mortality, such as heart failure, strokes, or MI. Um, our echo lab data, as I mentioned briefly, uh, compared to January 2020, um, we, where we had 2,000 cases in a month of echo readings, in March, that went down to 1,200. That's a 40% decrease, which is consistent with the data in other centers um, showing decrease in uh, consultations. In, by April, that decrease was 60%. Now we're getting back to the 40% decrease, so things are slowly gearing up. The, um, these declining admissions for acute cardiovascular illness is what has been um, known as the COVID-19 paradox. And as some of the speakers mentioned, this is not, um, it is unlikely due to just a decrease in unhealthy behaviors. I think that uh, people, if anything, everyone seems to think that they're either eating more or exercising less. And um, the decrease in air pollution and decreased salty meals in restaurants doesn't seem to be, um, explaining why people are coming less to the emergency departments. Um, I think that although, of course, the well-intentioned public messaging campaign straining pe in, among people the importance of staying at home um, to flatten the curve, there's been unintended uh, consequences. and individuals with vague symptoms seem to not want to come and even people who really need care. Uh, there's um, an increase in symptom to door time that, that's um, for patients presenting with acute coronary syndromes. Uh, one series in Australia saw an increase of four times the uh, time up to 11 hours from when people get the chest pain to when they make it to the emergency department. So not only are we seeing uh, less patients, we're seeing them late. So that explains in part the increase in mortality that we're seeing among our cardiovascular patients admitted with cardiovascular diseases. So I think that we are um, confronted with the great challenge. Um, we in, must ensure that our patients that have non-COVID-19 related illnesses um, get high quality care evidence-based. And also we have to reshape our care delivery systems in, our, in a very important way uh, novel approaches to patient management, as we heard today, and large-scale reallocation of resources. So it is a big task, but um, we have a great appreciation for all of our team members at the Right Care Initiative. We're so happy to have all of you here, and we have... Um, great appreciation for all of the dedicated, unprecedented resources we're getting, time, energy, as we all come together to fight these challenges in these time of need. And that's what I wanted to say. And uh, thank you for being here. Thanks, Dr. Stock. Um, Dr. Ree just wanted to make a comment in case anyone didn't see that there is still going to be uh, RCT looking at hydrochloroquine. Oh, there's Dr. Ree. Why don't you just make your announcement since you're there? Oh yeah, I mean like, you know, uh, so the data they are presented just to remind you all is still based on, you know, registry data, retrospective analysis and doesn't really, you know, prove uh, the true um, either benefit or or um, risk unless there's a clinical trial. So yes, there's a, a potential um, 
pause in the trial uh, by WHO, but I just saw a news article uh, by the uh, Oxford, uh, who is also running another trial on uh, hydroxychloroquine, and they decided to continue their clinical trial knowing the risk because it, they think that it's really important for us to answer uh, this question related to both efficacy as well as safety uh, of hydroxychloroquine in COVID-19. Mm -hmm. Thanks so much for sharing that. Um, let's go to the next slide because I know it's six o'clock and uh, people are gonna have to start dropping off. We're trying to end on time. So here's the advertisement for our next talk. Hattie, you wanna highlight the key points? Well, I'm just very, very pleased that everybody has uh, joined us uh, today. Um, and uh, we do put on these meetings two or three times a month. We're going to be shifting to just two times a month. Uh, and our next meeting will be from noon to 2.30 uh, on June 8th, which is a Monday. And it will be led by cardiologist Bill Balmer from UC Davis, who will also be talking as Dr. Ree did about the emerging science around the cardiovascular impacts of uh, COVID-19. The, the information like June was saying at the beginning of this talk is just coming out so rapidly and yet of course not rapidly enough for us to get ahead of it. Uh, although there were some really nice signals today in, in your presentation, uh, Dr. Ree, thank you. Uh, we're also going to hear another telehealth, uh, just in time uh, practical presentation from the head of UC Davis Telemedicine, who, uh, it, it turns out that UC Davis is the telemedicine contractor statewide for the state of California. So uh, we've never highlighted that in our work before because we've never really focused on virtual care. And I think it's a very healthy, healthy development that uh, we are um, evolving our practices with the available technology because of this public health emergency. I also want to point out that um, our third speaker on June 8th is uh, Dr. Carol Peden, who is our co-chair for Los Angeles. She was also the head of quality improvement for the National Health Service in the United Kingdom uh, in southern, uh, southern England. Uh, an anesthesiologist by training, she uh, works with John Berwick internationally to spread best practices. So. Uh, she's going to provide 30 minutes of information from uh, late breaking from around the world from her collaboratives there. And uh, she has access to some databases from uh, international hospital collaboration uh, that give, just as June was sharing with us, that early signal data, like for instance, will we see by June 8th uh, that the signal that we saw in June slides that perhaps statins are protective, uh, we may have some more information there. And I just wanna wrap up with asking June Rhee one more question. Because you did um, uh, basic science research on the biological mechanism of statins, could you talk about why you think this may uh, have some potential protective capacity? Oh, you mean like why statin might be beneficial for COVID-19? You know, again, I think it's be probably because of the pleiotrophic wonder uh, effects by statin, you know, it can potentially improve vascular health, uh, especially in COVID-19, there's some, you know, theories in vascular dysfunction. And as I, I talked about, you know, when you look at the stage of the infection, you know, towards the end, there's some more hyper-inflammatory response going on to, uh, to COVID-19, uh, to um, SARS-CoV-2, and maybe um, statin have some anti-inflammatory effects, as we know, in uh, cases of myocardial infarction. So, you know, I think there are a lot of uh, potential benefits. Again, the one from New England Journal of Medicine, actually, when they adjusted for many different clinical trials, the, uh, the, the benefit wasn't statistically significant. But when I looked into the Lancet data, uh, they did actually uh, still see some uh, with, um, persistent benefit this, uh, despite all the multivariate analysis. But again, these two are 
you know, the data from these two studies should be used in ca with caution because again, these are other registry-based retrospective data doesn't really prove the true benefit of statin unless we have a clinical trial. Thank, thank you, you so much. And thank you to everyone. Have a good evening. Hope to see you soon. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs>